we get started, I just wanted to kind of mention three books. We're going to talk about the Eucharist tonight, and um, these are probably my go-to books. Number one, Far and Away, is this one, and y'all can look at it afterwards. It's called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist by Brant Petrie. It's very, very good. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about one of the things in here, but there's a lot of typology showing how the Eucharist is shown to us both in the Old Testament and in the New. This other one is called Crossing the Tiber by Steve Ray, and he's going to talk a lot about his conversion, and in it he'll talk about the history of in Scripture and the Church Fathers about baptism and the Eucharist. And so it's called Crossing the Tiber by Steve Ray. And this one's just kind of a quick go-to book called The Biblical Basis for the Eucharist by John Salza. And it's just quick references throughout about where we see the Eucharist throughout Scripture. So just three suggestions on that. And I think they're great references. I won't be able to cover everything, but hopefully I'll hit some of the highlights and help you at least start to get an understanding of the Eucharist and some of the reasons we believe it, what, where the scriptural evidence is. And I recommend you go to those books for even more. To get started, I want to first read some things from the Catechism of the Catholic Church about the Eucharist. And so if this is going to be around Catechism um, section 1322 and following. And so what the Catechism talks about with the Eucharist is one of the seven sacraments. And I know you have talked about the sacraments to some degree. But the Eucharist is what the Church calls the source and summit of the Christian life. Every other sacrament revolves around the Eucharist. Because we believe that it is Jesus Christ himself. He is substantially present, sacramentally present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. He's made present. And so there's a couple different names that you may hear the Eucharist being referred to as. So first is Eucharist. That's the most common name probably. But it comes from the the Greek word Eucharistain. Eucharista, Eucharistain, which means an act of thanksgiving. And so even in Scripture, there are certain places in the New Testament where it says, and they gave thanks, they gave Eucharistane to God or whatever. And so um, that is referring, that's where we get this word Eucharist, this act of thanksgiving. Sometimes it's called the Lord's Supper because it begins on the Last Supper, on that night before Jesus died when he broke the bread. And so sometimes it's called the Lord's Supper. And it's also, in a sense, the Lord's Supper in anticipation of that heavenly banquet that we will one day hopefully participate in in heaven. Sometimes it's called the breaking of the bread. And in the Acts of the Apostles, you see this several times. They'll talk about how the disciples would gather together for the breaking of the bread, um, fellowship, and for prayers. And so this breaking of the bread is is the Eucharist. And you also see a very good depiction of this on the road to Emmaus. Jesus um, comes to those two disciples walking to Emmaus. We're told those two disciples are are blinded. They really don't know this is Jesus they're speaking to. And Jesus talks with them and walks with them and shows them how throughout Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come and have to die. And then they sit down at the table, and this is the end of chapter of Luke, um, and they'll sit down at the table, and when do the apostles, those two disciples, when do they see Jesus? In the breaking of the bread, their eyes are opened, they see that it's Jesus, and then he vanishes. And it's this hint of we now too can see Jesus in the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist. And so we have the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread, the Lord's Supper, Sometimes it's called um, the Holy Sacrifice or the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass because we do the Eucharist, the Mass is a sacrifice. I'm going to come back and talk about that one in just a second. Sometimes it's also called Holy Communion because it is a true communion. We're uniting ourselves to Christ and to His body, the Church. And that's how come when we come and receive the Eucharist, we must be in full communion with Christ and His Church. If you're not in full communion with Christ and His Church, then, then the church says we are not to participate at that moment. We can participate spiritually, but not physically by receiving the Eucharist, because it's a sign of our communion fully with Christ and His church. And so those are some of the common names that you may hear as far as the Eucharist. Um, I was going to talk about the sacrifice real briefly, because sometimes people will say, well, why are we sacrificing, sacrificing Jesus over and over and over at the Mass? But that's not what's happening. What's happening is we are becoming partakers in this mysterious way of the once-for-all sacrifice. So in the book of Hebrews, it gives us a little bit of a hint about this happening. And Hebrews is the end of chapter 7, 
it's talking to us about Jesus. And it talks about how Jesus came, and this is going to be chapter 7, verse 25. Jesus came for once for all to save those who draw near to God, and that Jesus always is living to make intercession for us. So there's this idea that Jesus is now making this constant, perpetual intercession for us in heaven. And if you jump down to chapter 8, it talks about this covenant that Jesus makes. It's a, it's a, he's the mediator of this greater covenant, this more excellent covenant. And then you can look down and um, see, let me skip to where it was, how throughout chapters 8, 9, 10, it's talking about how Jesus is now in heaven. It's this once for all sacrifice. It's this, we are called to enter into this heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is there standing before the throne of God and he's offering himself, making intercession for himself perpetually until the last day. And so what happens with the Eucharist in this mysterious way The past is made present and we enter into that moment at Calvary when Jesus is offering himself up for us because it's continuing to happen in heaven. And if you remember in the book of Revelation, when John has that vision of heaven and he sees Jesus, how does he describe him? He talks about seeing the throne of God and he says, I saw a lamb standing as though slain. Because what John sees is Jesus offering this once for all perpetual sacrifice in in front of God now even today because this is going to be an eternal perpetual sacrifice until the last day. And so at the Eucharist, we're participating in this sacrifice, this once for all sacrifice. So it is a sacrifice. It's just we're kind of making that once for all sacrifice present today. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more towards the end when we come back to the, the Passover. And so those are some of the, t- the terms, the titles we give to the Eucharist. And so the, with this most blessed sacrament, we receive grace. And so it is important, the church will say it is very important when you come to receive the sacrament, you're in full communion with the church, and you're in a state of grace. If someone has committed a mortal sin and they haven't yet gone to the sacrament of confession, they should not yet come to partake of the Eucharist because we're receiving Jesus himself. And we don't want to receive him unworthily. And we'll come back and talk about that. But we do receive grace. The other thing that's important is once the priest consecrates, uh, says the words of consecration and the, the bread and the wine are changed substantially into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, Jesus is fully present in both species. The species means the, the consecrated bread and the consecrated, consecrated wine. So the precious blood and the consecrated host, and so the precious body. And every little fleck and every little drop of blood of the wine is purely Jesus. And you can receive one or both. You don't have to receive both. If you even receive one of the species, you're receiving Jesus in entirety. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. And every little fleck of that consecrated host is 100% body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And that's how come, as I was talking to um, someone earlier, is every little fleck, we are very careful. You're going to, you'll see the priest making sure every little fleck is consumed. If the host drops, the consecrated host drops, it is a very important thing. They will go and get it and consume it and clean that area very sacredly. Same with the wine, the, the, constant, the precious blood. Every little drop is Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So you don't have to receive both, though you can. If the church is offering the, to receive it in both, you have the option to receive one or both. Um, but it, it just kind of keep that in mind that sometimes people think they have to receive both. He is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in each one the, and to the same degree. So you are receiving Jesus fully uh, with whichever species you receive or, or, or both. And then you're also receiving not only Jesus, but also grace. The grace we receive from sacraments. So one question that's very common whenever we're talking about this, is that the church teaches that Jesus is really and truly present. He's sacramentally present, substantially present. Is that really possible? And if we think those words, we have to step back and say, is that really possible? Absolutely. Because with God, nothing is impossible. This is the God we're talking about, who at the beginning of time created everything from nothing. God said, let there be light, and there was light. If God proclaims it, he can make it happen. When God says he can make us holy with his grace, he can make it happen because he's God and nothing is impossible with God. 
And so he makes all things from nothing. So if he can do that, then changing the substance of this bread and this wine is nothing. That's, it's far greater for God to make everything that we have today, that we can see today from nothing, than to, do, to, to make the, the real presence in the Eucharist. God is also not bound by the laws of nature. And so this is how come we believe miracles can happen. If you think, you know, we celebrated Fatima, um, the apparitions of Fatima last month. At that moment, God made the rain suddenly stop. He made the people become totally dry. He made the sun appear to dance in the sky. God can do anything. Um, He's not bound by the laws of nature. And so God can do miraculous things. Um, If you think about in Scripture, we see this happening all the time. Um, And I'm going to talk about some of the things that Jesus did to foreshadow some of this. But God's not bound by the laws of nature. And grace, God, that supernatural life, um, has more power than our nature. That's how come we can be transformed by grace. And then God also often acts through human instruments. Think of the Old Testament. God would work miracles through Moses. Moses and his staff were able to, to split the Red Sea so the Israelites could pass through it. God can make amazing things happen. And nothing's impossible with God. And as I mentioned, if God commands it, he can make it happen. And so we believe that with the Eucharist, through the priest or the bishop, if they've been given um, these these powers through holy orders to be able to consecrate um, the the bread and the wine to make it become Jesus' real presence, then it happens. Through those words, in imitation of Jesus, Jesus works through the lips and the hands of the priest or the bishop and makes the bread and wine truly become transformed. Let me see. So before I get to the next, next objection, I also want you to think about a few things that Jesus did. So think about Jesus. When he wants to heal the blind man, he uses mud and spittle, and then he works the miracle through that. After the man, He puts that on the man's face, and then he goes and has him wash it off. So Jesus can work through material things. At the wedding of Cana, Jesus' first miracle, what does Jesus do? He changes the water to wine. And what's fascinating about that is that's actually the, the, one of the, that's the first miracle, and it happens at Passover, at the time of Passover. So you think Passover happens, Jesus works his first miracle and changes water to wine. A year later, at the next Passover, what miracle does Jesus work? The feeding of the 5,000. So he's able to miraculously make this bread and fish multiply. So that many people, numerous, numerous people, can be uh, satisfied with food. And then what happens at the third Passover? The Last Supper. So that could be a foreshadowing of God changes the substance of something from water to wine. God makes something be able to be multiplied so that multiple people can now be able to be consume something and be satisfied through hunger. For us, it's spiritual hunger. And then at the Last Supper, he shows us how he's going to do this perpetually until the last day through the bread and wine that he makes his own body and blood so that he now can be this spiritual um, food for us. Mm. Mm-hmm. Bread. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wine, bread, and then the Last Supper. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thing, there's, no, there's no coincidences when it comes to God either. God doesn't do things just haphazardly. There's a purpose. And that's how come Scripture is so deep. You're going to look into something and always find something new because God doesn't, there's no coincidences. God intentionally does certain things for us so we can continue to learn more and more and deeper truths. Think of something else too. So we've talked about some amazing miracles, raising Lazarus from the dead. He brings a dead man who was dead because it was four days after, and now he's back to life. That's pretty miraculous. That shows God is not bound by certain laws. And then finally, the incarnation itself. God becomes man. There are more people who find that a million times harder to believe than in the real presence in the Eucharist. There are a lot more people who find it harder to become Christian then once Christian to then accept the Eucharist, that God would become man. God, the supreme being, would take on flesh and bones, have the same things we have to eat and drink and sleep and go to the bathroom just like us. So the idea that God would become man is a whole lot greater than the idea of God then becoming present in the Eucharist. 
So it's another thing to kind of ponder over. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but I'll jump, jump the gun a little bit. Of all the Christians in the world, the majority actually believe in the real presence. And we'll talk about how that is in just a little bit. So it's harder to become Christian than it is to become Christian and then believe in the real presence. Because of all the Christians in the world, if you take the Catholic and the Orthodox, and then you can kind of even include the Anglicans to some degree, they believe in the real presence. And so the Anglicans believe in the real presence, but it's actually not the real presence, and, and I'll talk about that. I don't want to jump the gun too much. So then the next objection is, well, it looks and tastes and feels like bread and wine, so how can they be substantially changed? So we can use this analogy. Think back when Jesus was alive. If he was here today walking among us, and we didn't know it was Jesus the God-man, we just knew it was some other Galilean walking among us. No one would have had a clue that he was God based on his appearance, based on how he walked and talked. He was a simple man. Now they do, did believe he had great wisdom and insight, and he was a great prophet. But just by looking at him, no one knew he was God. So just by looking at the Eucharist, you may not be able to tell by looking at it that it's substantially changed, but it's similar to us being able to look at Jesus and not be able to tell that he was truly who he said he was, that he was God. Because sometimes the physical appearances can be very deceiving. And another example would be um, the idea of grace. And so, and I used this analogy before, um, but grace is something that we truly believe transforms us. When we receive grace at baptism, we become a new creature. We become an adopted child of God. We become completely changed from who we were before baptism to who we were after. But by looking at that person, let's take two little babies who we baptize one who's not baptized, one who is. They don't look any different, but they're completely supernaturally different. Or even, even take two adults who one's been baptized, one hasn't been baptized. They're completely supernaturally different. And you can't tell necessarily by looking at them by their external appearance, but there is something that is radically different. Um, and that's the same with the Eucharist. Looking at that bread and the wine, you can't tell. But because of faith, we know that what Jesus said really happens, and we can know that that is something substantially different, sacramentally different, supernaturally different. Now, if we want to be kind of academic about this, because if you read some of the church's writings, the church is going to talk about accidents and substance to try to help in an academic way, philosophical way, to explain what's happening in a sense, is the best way we can. It's still a mystery. We can't totally grasp how it's happening. We just know this is what Jesus says happens, so we believe it. Now let's try to explain it. And so accidents are the, the things that something is made of. Um, kind of like the properties we can perceive, the way it looks or tastes or feels or smells. If we can perceive it by our senses, that's the accidents. The substance is like the foundation or the principle of what makes something what it is. So think of water. What is the substance of water? It's H2O, so hydrogen and oxygen molecules. That's what the substance of water is. What are the accidents of water? Well, it depends on what form it takes. It can be liquid water. It can be frozen like ice. It can be gas. So the accidents of water can actually change. The substance is always the hydrogen, oxygen, but the accidents can change. Think of like a, a chair. A chair is usually, let's say, a wooden chair. It's made of wood, but it can look a little different, different colors, different shapes. But the, the substance of it is it's a chair. It's something for sitting. And so when it comes to the Eucharist, we describe the accidents are what we can sense. The taste, the feel, the smell, the appearance. And then the substance is what it, what it is principally at its foundation. And so before consecration, it is simply bread and wine. But after consecration, the accidents don't change. It still tastes like wine, still looks like wine, still tastes like bread. But the substance has completely changed. And so the church calls it transubstantiation. Trans means change, and then substantiation means substance, a change of substance. So the accidents are the same, looks, tastes the same, but at, its, at the heart of it, the principle of it, the foundation of it, it is substantially changed. It's completely changed. There is no longer any bread left. There's no longer wine left. 
It is Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Now, a final example that may help, maybe, may, 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 may not help, is the appearance with Abraham and the angels in the Old Testament in Genesis. So there's this scene where Abraham's in his camp, and these three men come up to him, and we're told that these men are angels, at least two of them are angels. But they look like men, they talk like men, they eat like men. So Abraham, from everything he can tell at first, that he thinks these are men, because the accidents of them are just like any other human person. But at the heart of it, the substance is they're not human persons. They're angelic persons. They're very different. They're just taking on this form because they need to help Abraham with something. God's allowing them to take on this appearance for a purpose. But angels, in reality, don't have any kind of visible um, accidents. They're spiritual creatures, but they take on this. So we can see uh, the the visual things, the accidents, can be deceiving sometimes. They may look like men, but they're actually angels. So the bread and wine may look like bread and wine, but it's actually the real presence of Jesus. So we have to be careful not let our senses convince us of something that that is not true because if Jesus says it then I believe it now the next um, objection I sometimes get when it comes to the Eucharist is sacraments in general sometimes people will have a problem with this idea that it's what Christ did on the cross that's what matters nothing else matters I don't need these sacraments the Eucharist or baptism I don't need these things because I just need to believe in Christ but the reality is, is that it's not simply Christ on the cross only. It's Christ and His grace, and it's Christ, He's the one who chose that this grace be made available to us through the sacraments. This is Christ's way. This is how He has proposed the normative way of His grace being given to us and received to us is through the sacraments, primarily. You can also do some other things, but primarily the sacraments, baptism, Eucharist, confession, the sacrament of marriage. So Jesus chose that these sacraments be a conduit of His grace, be an instrument of His grace. And we can see that throughout Scripture. But again, you can go back to Jesus and the blind man, the clay and the spittle. Jesus could have simply said, blind man be healed. He could have simply thought it. Blind man be healed. He would have been. So why does Jesus use the mud and the spittle and the washing with the water so that he'll be healed? Because Jesus knows we're human persons. We have a body and a soul. We respond very well to these physical things. They sometimes help us to better connect with Jesus and connect to the spiritual world by having it connect to the physical world, which we're a part of. So it's, this is another very common one. Well, I just can't believe the Eucharist is the real presence because I don't understand it. But if we stop there and say, well, I don't believe it because I don't understand it, then how is it that we can believe in the Trinity and the Incarnation and in Heaven and Hell and God Himself? These are all things that are great mysteries that we can never completely grasp and understand. We can understand parts of them, but because we are human, we have a limited, a finite mind. We cannot understand the infinite God in all His entirety and all His fullness. The Trinity is a very difficult teaching to understand. One, one God, but three persons. The Incarnation, as I mentioned already, that God would become man and, and be just like us. Those are things that are very difficult, and we can't fully understand it. So if we stop there, then there's a lot of things that God has taught us that we can't, that we'll find it hard to believe. Harder to believe than even the Eucharist being the real presence. Now, the teaching of the real presence, that Jesus is really and truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, has been, was held by the first Christians for over a thousand years. No one debated it. No one challenged it. It was the teaching of the, of the church. There was no doubt for over a thousand years. You start to see people start to, some heresies start to form after this time that start to challenge this teaching. And so you'll start to see some, some questions arise. But to me, it's a pretty powerful statement that for the over 800 to 1,000 years, no one challenged it. But the first person to kind of seriously challenge this was a man named Berengarius of Tours. And so this is in the 11th century. 
So he kind of questions, how can this really be the, the real presence? How is Jesus really there? He starts to think it's simply a symbol. But then he'll eventually change his mind a little later, and then he, he'll retract his views and say, no, I believe it. And then you start to have a couple of the groups that form, the Albigensians. Um, then you'll start to have people like John Wycliffe, and they start to question this as well. And then the real change came in the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. You start to see a lot more people starting to reject this teaching in the 1500s. There were a few before that, but a big widespread rejection starts to happen in the 1500s. Now, who is the first to kind of really reject, reject this among the Protestant reformers? Martin Luther actually did not really reject it. Martin Luther did believe it was really Jesus present, but he disagreed with the church's explanation. So Martin Luther believed that after consecra- with the consecration, Jesus does become present, but the bread and wine are also still present. It's not completely changed. I mean, it really is Jesus, but he's only there for a short time, and then after the service, he, it's no longer Jesus. It's back to bread and wine. So he called it consubstantiation, with. Jesus is present with the bread and wine. They're kind of there. They're substances intermingle for a time. You have the service, and then it's just back to bread and wine again. So it's this really kind of new idea that Martin Luther came up with. Then you have a couple other Protestant reformers like Calvin and Zwingli, and they start to kind of get further and further away from this. Um, Zwingli was one of the first to really reject. It's just a symbol. It was more just a symbol to him. Calvin was kind of in between Luther and Zwingli. It wasn't completely a symbol, but it really wasn't that he's present there. There's this mystical experience. But then since then, a lot of the Protestant groups, um, evangelicals, fundamentalists, a lot of the the Baptist groups, it's all symbol. It's all symbolic, so they kind of take more after Zwingli. Um, Luther and Lutheran still have this idea of consubstantiation. There, it's there, but kind of not exactly like the Catholic view. Anglicans or the Episcopalians, they believe it's there because they're very Catholic. But King Henry in the in the 1500s split from the church, and when he did this, eventually he changes the way a priest is ordained. So they no longer have valid orders. They no longer have valid priests or valid bishops. So they cannot truly consecrate the bread and the wine. They think they are, and a lot of the people believe it's truly changing and truly is the real presence, but they don't have valid holy orders because they broke from the line of the apostles. So from Peter and the apostles, that's how you get this power to institute the Eucharist. It's because Jesus gave it to the apostles at the Last Supper, and they handed it down. So if you have apostolic succession, that's how you hand down this power to be able to do this. So when King Henry broke and then eventually changed the way a priest was ordained and bishops and stuff. So the bishops and priests are no longer valid. Yes, ma'am. Two questions. One is, um, when you read the Nicene Creed, mm-hmm. you use the, words, the word consubstantial. Uh, consubstantial, mm-hmm. It's different. That's about Jesus. So we believe Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, and that's different than the, the Eucharist. The Eucharist, he's saying, it's, he, uh, Luther is saying that the, the bread and the wine are consubst- uh, it's consubstantiation. So when the priest blesses the bread and the wine, Jesus becomes present for a moment for, while, they, while it's there and then they consume it and then he, he's gone. In the Nicene Creed, it's talking about who Jesus is. It's saying that Jesus is the same stuff, substance as God the Father. So they're both gods. So it's a different, it's a different kind of doctrine there. Mm-hmm. The second mm-hmm. question is, you've admitted that um, several of these things are very fantastic in, in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, yet, if these things are so fantastic, why, is it, why could it be equally fantastic that God did something different well, because I'm going to show you in a minute in Scripture where we're told that this is the Eucharist is what we're saying that it is. That the Eucharist really is Jesus present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And Jesus only wants one church, one faith. He doesn't want a whole lot of different divisions. He wants us to be united. And so the idea that people 
in the Reformation would kind of start it, kind of inventing new ideas and new interpretations of scripture is a little bit of a problem because then it starts to cause all these divisions among the church, among Christians. And so Jesus doesn't want that. But I'll show you where in scripture Jesus shows us and where Jesus and Paul and, and, and there's other revelations of where Jesus is showing us the Eucharist really is the real presence. It really is Jesus himself. Oh, uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And so, like, who gets to set the limit on mm-hmm. what God can do and can't do? Mm hmm. Because it almost sounds as though the Catholic Church has a lock on what God might do and what might not do. Mm-hmm. Well, kind of what we, what we believe is that Jesus gave us these teachings, this truth about the way things are, and it was handed down to the apostles, and the apostles have continued to hand it down through the bishops. And then if you break away from the church and kind of start these new ideas or new interpretations, then you are breaking away from the way Jesus had shown us the truth to be, if that makes sense. But, Okay. And so one of the things, too, that I would kind of mentioned, if you take all the Christians in the world, all Catholics and all Orthodox Christians, then the idea of the real presence is the majority, the vast majority of the percent of Christians in the world believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. And the Orthodox Christians are still, had they still have apostolic succession. So the Orthodox Christians are, they have, they're still have successors from the apostles just like the Catholic Church they just have a little they have kind of branched off a little bit because they don't totally recognize the Pope and this is a whole nother conversation but um, but the Orthodox are very very close um, because they have apostolic succession so if your teachings can be traced down through your bishops to the apostles to Jesus that's the sign of how you have that one faith handed down from Christ and so Catholics and Orthodox Christians have that apostolic succession to trace themselves back to Jesus. Now the church fathers, and I put two quotes on your handouts, the church fathers are those men who lived right after the time where the apostles lived and then died. And there's two particular church fathers that lived in that second century. So um, one of them is Ignatius. Ignatius knew the apostle John. And he knew some of the apostles. And so we see the writings of Ignatius and we show how it is the very beginning the church bishops were already starting to teach about the Eucharist. And so Ignatius of Antioch wrote this in 110 AD. And if you recall, John probably died around the year 100. And so he writes, he's talking about those who hold opinions different from the church, different from the bishops. He says, take note of those who hold opinions on those that are contrary to the mind of God. They're not going to partake of the Eucharist. They're going to abstain from the Eucharist and abstain from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins, and which the Father in His goodness raised up again. So he's showing that this Eucharist is really truly Jesus. It's, it's the flesh of Jesus in this sacramental way. And then one of the most beautiful lines is he talks about how the Eucharist is called the medicine of immortality and the sovereign remedy by which we escape death and live in Jesus forevermore. And we're going to talk about this in John chapter 6 because what does Jesus say? If you eat my body and drink my blood, you will have eternal life. And so this is the medicine of immortality, the medicine of eternal life. And so at the very beginning, 100 AD, the church everywhere throughout the known world was, was believing these things that Ignatius is writing about. Justin Martyr wrote this in 150 AD, and he was actually writing a letter to the emperor of Rome and letting him know about the Eucharist. He says, We call this food Eucharist, and no one is permitted to partake of it except one who believes our teachings to be true. For not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these. As we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer, set down by Him, so by Christ, and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nourished, is both the flesh and the blood of that incarnated Jesus. So He's saying that this Eucharist is no longer common bread, and it's no longer common wine. It is truly Jesus Himself, substantially present.
And so Justin is already talking about this in the year 150, talking about the mass and what happens and trying to explain to people who are very confused. A lot of the pagans were very confused when they heard these Christians were eating someone's flesh and blood. They called them cannibals. Because like these Christians are cannibals. They're eating someone's flesh and blood. So Justin Martyr is trying to explain to the emperor, it's not in this cannibalistic nature of truly eating bones and skin. It's in a sacramental, substantial way that we're partaking of the Eucharist. It is Jesus. It is his body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we're partaking of it in the Eucharist in this sacramental way where Jesus is made substantially present in the bread and the wine. And so even in the year 150, Justin is already teaching us these things. All right, and so another objection that I commonly hear is that it's unreasonable to believe that Christ is really present in this host, in the consecrated host, in the the precious blood, because we also would have to then believe that Jesus held his own flesh in his hands at the Last Supper. When Jesus held up the bread to the apostles and said, This is my body. And then he held up the chalice of wine and said, This is my blood. It's like, so, and I have a lot of people asking me, How is it possible that Jesus did that? Well, we believe it because Jesus says it. And if Jesus, Jesus is God, he can do anything. That would not be impossible. And it's just hard for our own finite minds and and reason to understand this. It's beyond our our capacity of understanding it to truly grasp it. So at the end of the day, we have to. I, I, at the end of the day, I say I believe it because God tells me this is what happened. I believe it because I truly believe that God, through Scripture, through tradition, through His Church, has shown us this to be true. And when Jesus says it, I believe it. If Jesus says this is my body, then I say Amen. I don't understand it completely, but I believe it. And then I'm going to show you now where it is that Scripture even shows us that these are things that we are to believe. Jesus really is present in the Eucharist. It is his real presence. So we're going to look at Jesus' words, Paul's words, and then something that we've talked about before, typology. So if you have a Bible, you can pull it out. If you don't, um, I'll tell you all the passages and you can look it up later. For first, Jesus' words. So John chapter 6. This is a very important chapter when it comes to the Eucharist. There's a, The second half of this is called the Bread of Life Discourse because Jesus is talking about the Bread of Life and he's talking about the Eucharist. And in this chapter, John chapter 6, we're going to first see the multiplication of loaves and fish, and then we're going to see Jesus talking about his, his own flesh and blood being bread and wine, and, and you're supposed to drink it, eat his flesh and drink his blood. So first, Jesus is going to emphasize to those people around him, it is very important for you to have faith. In John 6, he's going to tell them that the works that God asks of you is to believe, to believe in God, to believe in Jesus. He wants them to have faith. So you're going to have this great miracle of multiplication of loaves and fishes to help with their faith. And then you're also going to have Jesus calling on them to have faith. They need to have faith. He's going to emphasize that. And what he's trying to have them start with is that Jesus is who he says he is. Because they still have to grasp that he's God. They're still, it's still a work in progress. They're not completely there at this point in, the, in his ministry of completely understanding who Jesus is. And so Jesus will tell them, because they're going to say, the people are then going to start, they want a sign. They want Jesus to show them something that shows that he, he is who he says he is, that he's a prophet of God. And Jesus just worked this miracle of feeding loaves and fishes. What more do they need? And Jesus is going to tell them that, um, because they're going to ask Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So he's saying, I, you need to believe in me. That's your first thing, you need to believe in me. So he's going, he wants them to have faith. Because he knows it's hard for them to recognize his divinity. Because he's veiled in his humanity. So they just see this human man. They can't see through it that he's God. And then, then as he continues, he's going to start to show them, because I'm going to actually call you to even greater faith. Because I'm now going to ask you to believe in my humanity and my divinity veiled in something else, and he, in, the, in the bread and, and the wine. He doesn't completely get into that yet in John 6, but he's leading them there, that I need you to believe that I am God, 
but I'm calling you to even greater faith because I'm going to call you to believe that the Last Supper truly is that bread and wine it has been changed into my body and blood. So he's coming into great faith. And then in John 6, what we're going to see in verses 47 to 51, he's going to begin this section by talking about the manna in the desert. Now, what was the manna in the desert? It was a pretty miraculous thing. The Israelites were in the wilderness. They had just crossed the Red Sea. They're starving. They don't have food. They're, they're panicking. They want to be back in Egypt because they have no good food here in the wilderness. And so Moses cries out to God, and God sends them a great gift. Every day for the rest of their time in the wilderness, manna will appear every morning. And this is bread from heaven. In a sense, this is bread that's come down from heaven. They don't know where it comes from. It's just provided to them by God. And so Jesus says, you remember the manna in heaven? And he says, you know, that, that was a great thing for your ancestors. I mean, it was miraculous. And the, I, the thought is there were probably several hundred tons of it every day because of the millions of people that needed to be fed. So you have this great miracle that happens, and then Jesus says, I'm greater than that. I have a greater miracle for you than that. Because that bread that came down from heaven, they, they ate it and they still died. But if you eat this new bread from heaven, you will eat it and live forever. You'll have eternal life. So Jesus is saying he's the new bread from heaven that is greater than that manna. So that miracle that happened in the Old Testament, there's a new miracle that's going to happen that's even greater. Because it's going to give you eternal life if you eat of it. So first start talking about the manna. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. I don't hear people saying that they're substantially sheep mm-hmm. or lambs. Mm-hmm. He says, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Mm-hmm. But we don't make this big deal saying that every time I come to church, I turn into a little lamb. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter, I'm going to call you this name, and your name becomes a rock. Mm-hmm. But we don't believe that he literally became a stone. Mm-hmm. Then he says... If you eat this, you'll never die. But people die mm-hmm. every day. Mm-hmm. But people hearing that would have to extrapolate that this is a metaphor for some other type of life. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of wondering, what, what is like this big deal breaker that unlike all these other things Jesus said metaphorically, mm-hmm. this is one thing that the church says, there's no way mm-hmm. that this could be a metaphor. Mm-hmm. It has to be real. While you accept all mm-hmm. these other images that Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, he used mm-hmm. consistently. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. He might build upon you. Absolutely. Not just walking around mm-hmm. with wood on mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. and I, I'm not yeah, there has to, I'm just saying there has to be something mm-hmm. yep. that means something mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That should actually regard whole groups of people as heretical mm-hmm. and actually stage war theaters mm-hmm. to fight for this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, And it has to be more than just... Well, let me finish all the scripture stuff and I'll show you. I'll show you why we believe it. So let me finish all the scripture stuff. Because, yeah, absolutely, he does use a lot of metaphors and we have to kind of discern when, what's a metaphor and what's not. The manna is a metaphor. He's saying, I'm greater than the manna. It's a metaphor. He says, I'm the new bread from heaven. He's still talking in in some metaphoric ways that he's the new bread from heaven. He's this new miracle that's come down from heaven. And so, but he's going to show us here in just a minute that this, there's something different now about this metaphor compared to I'm the gate or I'm the sheep or I'm the shepherd and the gate and the vine and all those. He's going to show us here in just a second there's something special about John chapter 6. Uh-huh. And so Jesus is saying that I'm greater than this manna, this miraculous bread from heaven. I'm this new bread from heaven. And so Jesus' bread needs to be more real and, and more miraculous than even the manna. And I think there's a lot of people that, okay, that's great. He's the bread from heaven. That's this great symbolic way of, I need to believe in you and consume your word, consume what you say. And, and that's great. So Jesus is actually going to stress a few really important things if we know the Greek. And I'm going to show you a couple words in the Greek that are very important. So if you look at verse 55, and Jesus does not do this with his other metaphors. So Jesus in verse 55, he's going to say, so Jesus has been talking to them several times about 
that I'm the new bread from heaven, I'm the bread of life. If you eat of this, you will not be hungry. If you drink it, you will not be thirsty. Um, He says that, truly I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I'm the bread, I'm the bread of life. And then the Jews are kind of saying, I don't, I don't get it. We know this man. He's just this simple Nazarene. What is he talking about? What does he mean? How can he be talking about? He's giving us this bread from heaven. And Jesus says, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so then the Jews are saying, what is he talking about? And this is in verse 52. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So the Jews listening to him start to understand he's telling them they need to eat his flesh. And they're horrified because to a Jew, they could not eat fleshly things with blood. So they're saying, how is this man telling us we have to eat his flesh? That's horrifying. And then Jesus, he doesn't get a little easier and say, explain a parable like he would do before. Because sometimes the apostles were even like, I don't get it. And he'd be like, here's what I mean. Here, the Jews are like, I don't get this. He wants us to eat his flesh. And Jesus says, he looked at them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 55, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So some pretty powerful words. And if you look to the Greek, in verse 55, when he says that my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed, that indeed, sometimes it can, the Greek word there is a lathos. It means really, truly, most certainly. There's other words he could have used if he wanted to say that it's symbolically, I'm, I'm asking you to symbolically eat my flesh or symbolically drink my blood. He's telling you in verse 55, For my flesh is most certainly food, and my blood is most certainly drink. It is really, truly food and drink. So in verse 55, that Greek word, alethos, is emphasizing something. So Jesus is emphasizing that he is really saying, My flesh and blood are to be food and drink. But then what's going to happen is the Jews are going to be really upset by this. The Jews are like, this is, re- this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? And so Jesus just says, you know, who, um, do you take offense at this? And he says, I'm going to show you something greater. Um, because he's going to say that then if, if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before... He's going to go on to talk about how I'm going to show you some greater things than what I'm talking about right now. But what's going to happen is the disciples are going to walk away. Some of the disciples are going to leave because they're so offended by what Jesus is saying. They don't understand it. They're saying, they're try- he, they think he means we need to be cannibals and eat his flesh and drink his blood. The Jews are scandalized by this because they don't eat meat with blood still in it. They don't drink blood at all. So the, Jew- the disciples leave. This is one of the only times in Scripture we see disciples leaving Jesus. And Jesus doesn't stop them. He doesn't go after them. He doesn't say, wait a minute, you misunderstood me. He lets them go and he turns to Peter and the apostles and said, are you going to leave too? And Peter will say, well, no, only you have the words of eternal life. And so Jesus knows the Jews walked away, taking him literally, and he didn't stop them from leaving. Because that's what he meant. He meant what he said. Those those Jewish disciples understood him. And they left. And Jesus didn't stop to explain it. And you know Jesus is God. He would have known what they were thinking. He would have known what they believed. And had they been completely misunderstanding him, why didn't he, out of mercy, stop and say, wait, you're misunderstanding me? No, he knew. He was asking them something very, very hard to understand. But they needed to trust him because he was going to explain it to them more over the next year. Because he's going to explain it to the apostles because the apostles don't get it. Peter doesn't get it. They're like, I don't know what he's talking about, but I trust him. And if he's saying it, I trust him. So now if we also go to the Greek, we're going to see something even more powerful if we look back over it. Because what we're going to see, if we look at the Greek, at the very beginning when Jesus is talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood in verses 23 to 53... Jesus will use, John will talk in Greek, write in Greek, using this Greek word phago. And he'll use this the first nine times that he uses eat. When Jesus says, I want you to eat my flesh, and eat my body, and eat my flesh, it's phago. It's very generic, 
It's possible this could be a symbolic way of eating. It could have been fake. Fago can be used for symbolic eating. But when the Jews start questioning Jesus and doubting Jesus and saying, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. This is too hard. The Jews become very skeptical. So then what Jesus does, or what John has Jesus do in the Greek, is change the word he starts using for eat. And he starts using the last four times, trogo. And trogo means to gnaw or to chew, like on meat. So it doesn't get less clear or more ambiguous. It actually gets more definite. He is talking about meat, eating and gnawing and chewing on fleshly meat. So the last four times in verse 54 to 58, when John has Jesus talking about, I want you to eat my flesh and and drink my blood and eat eat my flesh, it means to gnaw or to chew. This is never used in symbolic language. Gnawing and chewing is meant for meat, and you can't find anywhere in Scripture where it's talking about that in a symbolic way. It is literally to eat and to gnaw and chew. So when Jesus knows they're starting to question him and become skeptical, he doesn't start to explain to them this is very symbolic. No, he gets more firm. This is gnawing and eating and chewing flesh. So he gets very um, specific with the terms that he's using, with eat, John does with the Greek, to show this is what Jesus meant. So exactly what the Jews thought is what he's saying. So he, he, Jesus, John doesn't have Jesus softening his teaching. He has it become more emphatic by his changing of the words. Now what we also want to look to is the Last Supper. The Last Supper happens about a year after this event. With John. John 6 happens, and about a year later is when the Last Supper happens. So, for a year, Peter and the Apostles probably have no idea exactly what Jesus was talking about in John 6 with eating my flesh and drinking my blood. They probably were a little confused also as to how they were supposed to do that. But then they come to the Last Supper, and now Jesus explains it to them. How is it they're going to eat his flesh and drink his blood to have eternal life? So, if you look at the four accounts of the Last Supper Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then Paul, when he talks about it in 1 Corinthians, you're going to see Jesus. And every time Jesus says this, Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood. Now, in, in, Jesus would have spoken in Aramaic. In that language, there are ways, there are words that can mean, this is like my body, or this is symbolic of my body, or this represents my body. There are words for that. But Jesus didn't choose to use those words. Jesus says, this is my body, and this is my blood. He says those words. And if you look to actually the Greek of how, because the New Testament was written in Greek, um, if you look at how it was written, when we we translate it to English, we lose a little something. Because the Greek actually, if you want to translate it very literally to the Greek... Jesus says, basically, this is the body of mine. So this is the body of mine. There's this article, the, that's kind of left out. This is the body of mine, or of me. Some scripture scholars also say they really, in in Greek, didn't have this word that meant body. It always meant flesh. So this is my flesh, is also another way of interpreting um, the Greek to the English. This is my flesh. This is the body of me, of mine. And so he's being very emphatic when he says this. And then I think if we look to St. Paul, who was one of the early, early disciples and apostles of Christ, he's going to show us that this interpretation of John 6 and of the Last Supper is exactly what we think it is. Because Paul is going to show us something pretty amazing, I think. Now one of the other things to kind of point out as well is in Matthew and Mark and a similar thing in Luke, Jesus will also say this is the blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so what Jesus is saying is this, holding up the chalice with the wine, this is the blood of the covenant. What blood of the covenant? His blood that he will shed on the cross shortly after this is happening. And he says poured out. Poured out is this very sacrificial phrase that he uses. So this sacrificial blood that he's about to pour out and offer for us That is exactly what he's holding up in that chalice. And so he doesn't say it's symbolic of it or it's like it. He says this is the blood of the covenant. And then the other thing is in Luke and also in Paul, 
Jesus, they'll also have Jesus saying, do this in remembrance of me. So this is my body, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me. And he's talking to the apostles. And that term in Greek is anamnesis. That's a sacrificial word. So he's saying, do this sacrifice in, in, um, in memorial of me. It's a memorial sacrifice. It doesn't just mean, and we're going to talk about this with the Passover... But a memorial sacrifice isn't one where we just sit there kind of looking through a photo album and looking at memories. The, Greek, the Jewish people did not understand that in that terms at all. Memorial sacrifice means making the past present. So every time they celebrate this anamnesis, this sacrificial anamnesis, they're making the past present. They're now there with Christ at this moment when he offers this sacrifice on the cross. And so this, do this in remembrance of me, do this anamnesis of me, is this sacrificial offering that he's asking the apostles to do. Um, And we'll talk about that a little more here in a minute with the Passover. But to jump to Paul, because he's going to show us that Jesus says, what Jesus says is what he means. And this is one of my favorite passages to, that really, to me, just, when I saw this, I was like, whoa, this is really powerful text about the Eucharist being the real presence. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, at the very beginning, Paul is talking about the liturgy and how the Christians are in Corinth are gathering together to celebrate the Mass. And he's talking about the liturgy, and he's getting on to them at first. Because he says, you cannot come to this drunk and segregating each other with some people here, some people are there. This is Mass. This is a communion. This is the liturgy. We come together worthily. So he's going to talk about that at the beginning. And then he'll quote the words of Jesus. He says, if you remember, Jesus at the Last Supper said these words, this is my body, this is my blood. And actually, I'll read it to you. I think that may help. And so he's talking about the the, the Mass, the, the Eucharist. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the chalice, chalice, saying, This chalice is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the chalice, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then verse 27. Powerful passage. Paul says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Now some translations will say, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Some say guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. They mean the same thing. And in Jewish terms, and Paul was a great Jew, he would have, when he wrote this, the, the Greek words used, was this understanding of profaning someone personally, literally. So what this passage means, a good analogy would be, if I take a, let, let's say there's a governor and there's a statue or, or something of him, of this governor, and I, I don't like the governor, I'm mad or angry, so I chop the head off that statue just to vandalize it because I'm so angry. Okay, I mean, that's disrespectful, it's vandalism, you know, the, the governor's going to be upset, but it's not hurting the governor. It's completely different than I go and if I chop off the head of the governor. It's a completely different understanding of being guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What Paul is talking about is the latter. I would be literally guilty of having damaged Jesus himself. Not in the memory of him, not a picture of him, not a statue of him. I'm guilty of the body and blood of the Lord if I come unworthily. Which is why the church tells us when we come to receive the Eucharist, we must be in a state of grace in communion with Christ and his church so that when we receive him, because he is there, he, where he's not entering into us it's such, such that we defile him that we are being guilty of profaning his body and blood. And so Paul is saying, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He's guilty of, you're guilty of damaging the Lord in a sense. Even though he's God, he can't be damaged, but you are harming, you are doing, you're defiling God. You're defiling Jesus by bringing him into you if you're coming unworthily. And Paul was upset because these Corinthians are doing that. They're coming unworthily and they're defiling Jesus when they consume him. But then Paul continues. Paul then goes on to say, just after this passage, 
Let a man examine himself, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So if you come and you do not discern that Jesus' body is present, and then you eat it unworthily, consume him unworthily, you're bringing judgment on yourself. So Paul says, examine yourself so that you can come and eat of the bread and drink of the cup, and then discern that this is Jesus. Because if you don't and you come unworthily, you bring judgment upon yourself. And then Paul continues, This is why many of you are ill and infirmed, and a considerable number of you are dying. If we discerned ourselves, we would not be under judgment. So Paul is saying, you have come unworthily, you've consumed Jesus in the Eucharist unworthily, you are now sick and dying because of this. You have brought yourself under judgment because of what you've done defiling Jesus in the Eucharist. So Paul is being very, very harsh to the Corinthians who are coming unworthily to the Eucharist. And to me, it's a very powerful statement that Paul believes Jesus is really and truly present in the Eucharist. And he believes what has been handed down to him from Christ and from the apostles. And that is why he is so stern with these Corinthians, saying you have to come worthily to receive Jesus because he's really present. And if you don't come worthily, you're defiling Jesus in those actions. So now in the last few minutes, I'm going to do one more thing, and then that will kind of wrap it up. But this is um, something that's called typology. And there's so many examples of this, I'm just going to pick one. But if you get the book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, there's a lot of typology in here, which shows how God was preparing us bit by bit by bit, to receive this truth because God knows us better than we know ourselves and God knows this is something that's very hard for us to accept so little by little over time he's been preparing us for this truth throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament and the New Testament one of the typologies that I'm going to use one of the comparisons is the Passover and so typology is whenever God foreshadows something so you have an Old Testament event that foreshadows something in the New it is, it's God's way of showing a shadow of what is to come. And the book of Hebrews talks about this. They were merely shadows of what was to come. So Passover is a shadow of the new Passover. And this is on your handouts. But you can, you can see the Passover and the Paschal Lamb in Exodus chapter 12, Numbers chapter 9. And what we're going to see is this is actually a prefigurement of Jesus and a prefigurement of the Eucharist. Because you had the original Passover and the original Paschal Lamb. Now you're going to have the new Passover and the new Paschal Lamb, which is Jesus. And the Passover, if you remember, that's after the, after the, you have the plagues that happen in Egypt. Through God, through Moses, sends the plagues. The last plague is the angel of death. And what's going to happen? All the firstborn children of the, of, of, men and of animals is going to die if they don't obey what God says. And so God is going to give Moses a command and he's going to command Moses to do something, to have the Israelite people do something. And if they don't, the angel of death will hit their houses and and their firstborn will die. So here's the Passover and here's how it correlates in a sense with Jesus. So with the Old Testament Passover lamb, and I guess before I get there, let me just clarify something too. So you had, Jesus said, I need, if you want to live and not die with the angel of death, you need to take a lamb and you're going to take the blood of the lamb, sacrifice the animal, and then mark the doorposts with the animal's blood, and then he's going to give them a few other commands. And if you do it, you'll be saved from this angel of death. If you don't do it, then people will die. So the Old Testament Passover lamb had to be pure, it had to be unblemished with no broken bones. When the New Testament, John, when he's talking about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, makes a point to say Jesus had no broken bones. And Jesus is also this innocent victim, pure victim, without sin, he's unblemished. So Jesus is just like that Old Testament sacrificial lamb. And we even remember John the Baptist, what does he call Jesus? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world because he is the new Paschal Lamb. And so the Old Testament Paschal Lamb was sacrificed 
and he was an innocent victim for another person, for the Israelites. Jesus is the new Passover lamb. He's also sacrificed an innocent victim for us. The animal, the, the Old Testament lamb, his blood was put onto two doorposts, had to be put on two doorposts. Well, Jesus' blood was shed on two wooden panels, the two wooden posts, the cross. The lamb of the Old Testament Passover had to be eaten by the people. It wasn't just mark your doors. You mark your doors with his blood and you consume the lamb. And so the lamb of this new covenant, the new Passover, also must be consumed by the people. Well, how does that happen? How do we eat this new Passover lamb? How do we consume him? The only answer is the Eucharist. And then, just like in the Old Testament, only the chosen people could partake in this meal. And in the New Covenant, it's the same way. And, and the reason that we don't have people who aren't communing with the church and with Christ taking it is because of what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We don't want people to come unworthily. So if they don't know that this really is Jesus, and they don't know that if they can consume Him, they could be defiling Him and building sin upon sin within their own soul, then we're doing it as, as t- taking care of their soul because we don't want people to do something they're not aware of what they're doing. Mm-hmm. When you did uh, show scripture about St. Paul, I work as a hospital chaplain. Mm-hmm. So when, if I have Catholics who believe that they have cancer um, and other diseases, and they're actually telling me, or it's because of something I've done wrong, mm-hmm. I probably should correct them. I, mean, I should probably say, well, maybe if you took that communion unworthily, that might be why you're sick right now. I mean, mm-hmm. right. We don't, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't know. So we know that Jesus does say that sometimes sin just happens. Sometimes bad things just happen. It doesn't necessarily mean just because you sin. So bad things don't happen just because you sin. Sometimes God just lets bad things happen. Sometimes bad things happen to me, like I may get cancer for, so that I can become more holy because suffering can be offered up to God. And we can say, God, I'm uniting myself to Jesus on the cross and I'm going to unite my suffering to His and I'm going to use that to become more holy. So sometimes God lets suffering happen to us so that we can become holy because we believe that suffering is redemptive. Just like Jesus' is suffering on the cross redeemed the world, our suffering can be united to that and can be redemptive. It can help us get to heaven and become holy. So we don't believe just because someone is sick and dying that it's because they've done something wrong. We have no idea. All, all I know is this is what St. Paul says. And so St. Paul was saying that it's possible. If the person believes it, that is because of that scripture, then really I, I would just tell him, I would just call, yeah, tell him, you know what, I think you need to have call, talk to a priest and go to the sacrament of confession. That's all they would need to do. If they go to the sacrament of confession, if they do believe that I was living in a state of adultery and I didn't go to confession about it and I took the Eucharist, that, that's sin upon sin. You're defiling Jesus. So they need to go to confession. I would direct them to a priest, get a priest there as soon as possible, especially if they're sick and may die, as soon as possible so they can have the sacrament of confession, have their sins forgiven, and then they're restored. That grace is restored within them. And so if, they, if they're afraid they've done something sinful to make them be in their state of sin or, or suffering, call a priest. Get them there as soon as possible. And, I mean, we know that St. Paul says that, but we don't necessarily believe that every time I'm suffering it's because of something I've done wrong. But, but St. Paul says he believed that some of those Corinthians were suffering because of what they had done when it came to the Eucharist. Because they were coming drunk. They were coming, you know, we know in, in Corinth there was that man who was having, um, living with his stepmother and having a relationship with his stepmother. And, and then we know the Corinthians were, Paul is constantly on to them for all the different sins they're committing. So we know they weren't living holy lives. So Paul was angry with them. So he's showing them, you are coming defiling Jesus. So he's, he's warning them, but it, it, doesn't mean, and it, it doesn't mean we can't. If we come unworthily, we are building sin upon sin. If we receive the Eucharist not worthy and not a worthy way, it's kind of building sin upon sin. We do have to be very careful. But yeah, I think if someone believes I've done something wrong, that's why I'm suffering, call a priest and let them confess their sins to him for sure so their soul can be healed. Okay? Um, so... Back to the Old Testament, New Testament. So only the, only the chosen can partake of it. Only the um, believers, only those united in communion with Christ and His church. 
can partake of this one. And as I mentioned, consumption of that Old Testament lamb is what saved those people who ate that lamb. Just like Jesus tells us in John 6, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will have eternal life. The consumption saves them. And then just like in the Old Testament, what was one of the other things that Jesus did by giving them that Old Testament lamb, that Passover lamb? He knew they would have several days' journey ahead of them. It was going to help nourish them for the journey. Just like the Eucharist nourishes our soul for our earthly journey. So there's this idea of nourishment in a spiritual way that comes with the Eucharist. And with us, we're just like the Israelites. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul even shows, he goes, I want you to remember what happened with Moses and the Israelites, because it's just like us. Moses and the Israelites were in slavery, and then they had to be freed, just like we're in slavery to sin. We need to be freed by Jesus. Moses and, and the Israelites crossed through the Red Sea, just like we passed through baptism. They enter into the wilderness, their journey to the promised land. Our journey is right now here on earth. Our promised land is heaven. And then St. Paul tells them, this is, this is for us. We're supposed to see the analogy. Just like in the Old Testament, in the wilderness, they had spiritual food and spiritual drink. This manna from heaven and this water from the rock. This miraculous bread, this miraculous water appeared to them to help them along the way. Just like with us, there's now this supernatural bread, the supernatural wine that we can consume that is our spiritual journey as we are going to the promised land heaven. And then in the Old Testament, the Passover, it didn't just happen once. Every year, the Jewish people celebrated it. Every year. And it was something that, ha- even though the Passover itself happened at one time, one moment in time, every time a Jewish person celebrated it, they enter in and they make that past present. The Passover was an anamnesis sacrifice. It was a sacrifice where you make the past present. An anamnesis. Just like the New Testament Passover lamb, the New Testament Passover, we're making the past present. It happened at one moment in time, but in this mysterious way we're entering into it. So we're now at the foot of the cross. Just like the Israelites enter into it like they are there with Moses and their, an- and their ancestors. And then the Old Testament Passover was also linked with unleavened bread just like the New Testament Passover is linked with unleavened bread. So there's a lot of comparisons. Now, no typology is perfect, but it's to show us God is helping to prepare us little by little. And there's a lot of other examples of this throughout the Bible that I encourage you to read about. In your handouts, I even kind of list there some special things about the Passover meal. I'm not going to go through them, but there's a lot of even similarities as to how they celebrate the meal as to what we do in the Eucharist. So you can kind of read that as well. And so with all typology, Christ is the fulfillment. Christ is the center of everything. He's the center of history. He's the center of scripture. So if you understand Christ, then you can look back now at the Old Testament, the New Testament. Everything's going to make more sense. Everything will be fulfilled in Christ. And so Christ is the new high priest. There was a priest, a priest king, Melchizedek. He offered sacrifices to God with bread and wine. We're told in Hebrews, Jesus is the new high priest of the order of Melchizedek. So if he's from the priestly order of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek offered bread and wine as a sacrifice, then it makes sense that Jesus will offer bread and wine, but now that bread and wine becomes something even greater. The new Passover lamb. Jesus is the new manna. And then this one everlasting sacrifice of this new covenant is what Jesus offered once at Calvary and we continue to enter into every time we celebrate the Eucharist, every single day. And so God has revealed to us the Eucharist is truly Jesus, substantially present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It really is the real presence. And so why did Jesus give us this great gift of the Eucharist? Why does Jesus make himself present to us in this way? Fulton Sheen says that the greatest love story of all time is contained in a tiny white host. Because what happens with the Eucharist is every time we celebrate this, we enter in to the greatest act of love that ever happened. And that's Jesus on the cross dying for us. We enter into that. We unite ourselves to Christ in this intimate way at the Eucharist because the Paschal mystery, which is Jesus' suffering and death, The Paschal mystery is made present. So we can stand at the foot of the cross in this mysterious way at the Eucharist and we can enter into that moment where God offers himself for us.
and we can start to see that great love that God has for us. And so from the beginning, God demonstrated his love for us. It was unconditional. First, his act of creation. He didn't have to make anything. He didn't have to create anything. He didn't need, to need us, but he did it because of love. God created us because of love. God made man in his own image and likeness because of love. God surrounded Adam and Eve with the greatest, most abundant goodness. Everything they could want or need, he gave it to them. He continued to show his love. And then throughout salvation history, he's shown his love. You know, you have um, Abraham is called to be the leader of the chosen people. Moses is called to help free the people from slavery. David is going to be the great king of Israel. The prophets come to help show the people when they're falling away and falling into slavery. So God has continued to intervene and to reach out to us to show us his love and to help us be guided along the right path. And then in the fullness of time, God sent his son Jesus, the greatest event, the incarnation. And what we see is a comparison now that Jesus, the new Adam, shows us the deficiencies of the first Adam. So the first Adam was surrounded by abundant goodness. Everything he could want, everything that he could need, and he rejected God. But now the new Adam... He comes, and in the midst of the most cruelest form of torture, amongst humiliation, amongst the greatest suffering you can ever imagine, and crucifixion is the worst way to die ever, and his friends abandon him, other than his mother and some women, and then St. John comes back, but other than a few people, his friends abandon him. So he's tortured, he's mocked, he's humiliated. But at the point of death, Jesus never lost his love for us because he freely chose to sacrifice himself on the cross. He freely chose it because he loved us so much. He never let his love for us die. He never let his love for God the Father die. And so God's love was returned by... God the Father's love was returned by Christ's perfect love. And then the Trinity, the triune God, continues to love us perfectly as well. And so this act of love by Christ, through this, humanity now was redeemed. We now have this restored relationship with God. It is now possible for men to once again enter heaven. And so man, even though we had shown ourselves to be undeserving, ungrateful, unloving, proud, we had shown ourselves to be sinners, despite this, through God's infinite love and great act of mercy... God came and loved us and died on the cross for us. And so the Paschal Mystery is this great expression of love. And so with the Eucharist, we're now able to enter into that moment. It's reactualized, it's represented. That past event is made present. So we can now enter into that moment. And we too can kind of look up at the cross and unite ourselves to Jesus. The Eucharist is this perpetual reminder of God's love for us. And Jesus in heaven still stands continuing to offer intercession for us until the last day. And we nod ourselves to that. So we can, look, we can kind of put ourselves at the foot of, cro- foot of the cross and look up to God and say, Because of my sins, this had to happen to you. Because of me, you were there suffering and dying for me. And so we can see the depths of God's love and also the horror of our sins because we can look at the cross and see what had to happen because of our sins. So in every Eucharist, we can represent this love act of Christ, this great love story between God and us. And so through this Eucharist, we can now have this intimate union with Christ at the cross, plus now we can consume him, this bread and this wine that has been now transformed. It truly is, it really most certainly truly is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ that we can consume so that he can now become this intimate part of us. And we now have this participation in in God's divine nature by him entering into our souls, into into, into our entire being. So Jesus enters into us, kind of in this imperfect way, because in heaven it will be this perfect union between us and God. And now it's this still a union, but it's imperfect because we're still here. But it is a great union with us and God. It's this great communion with Christ and his church. Pope Francis, in one of his recent um, encyclicals, Lumen Fide, he had said that the Eucharist is this act of remembrance. We make the past present, And it allows us to move from the visible to the invisible. It allows us to move 
to the, the natural, to the supernatural, we can start to see the heights and depths of reality. Because what we can see and taste and feel here, there's even a greater reality in the supernatural world. So the Eucharist kind of helps remind us of that. It kind of helps to move our whole being from the visible to the invisible to see that this material world isn't all there is. There's actually something greater, this supernatural reality. So our whole being can be moved to the realities of God and heaven. And so this glorious sacrament constantly remind us, reminds us that everything we do here on this, in this earthly life has eternal consequences. Everything. And so we want to make sure that every day we're uniting ourselves more and more deeply to Christ, having greater and greater communion, coming to the Eucharist more and more worthily every day, receiving the Eucharist as much as we can so that we can be given this great grace and being able to unite ourselves intimate, intimately with Christ so that we can continue to be transformed. And so that we can continue with St. Paul to say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And we mean that in a very real way. And so in the Eucharist, we can give thanks to God and praise for everything he's done. But this is the power of the Eucharist. Like Fulton Sheen says, it's this great love story. Let me see, I'm just going to skip to the end because I've read all these. So, um, as I mentioned, I would definitely recommend these books because I can only go through so much in this short period of time. Um, but read these books and you know, reflect on the handouts. And then if you have any questions, feel free to email me at any point. Um, but at this point, I'll go and take any other questions that you guys may have. The act of contrition? Confession. Confession. So, somewhere in the Mm-hmm. 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 So the people way back, the Corinthian people, mm-hmm. they were sinners. And they were mm-hmm. So where in the history of the world did they become? Because those people... They confessed their sins to a priest named Paul. They did that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So it's, been um, it's been around from the beginning. So St. Paul even talks about in, in his letter to the Corinthians that I forgave your sins in the, in the person of Christ. And he talks about I was given the ministry of reconciliation. And so Paul talks about how he was given this ministry of the sacrament of confession. They don't call it that, but he calls it the ministry of reconciliation. And he tells them that I didn't forgive your sins, Christ did it through me, basically. So it started at the very beginning. When, when Jesus gives the disciples that gift at, um, after he rises from the dead in John chapter 20, um, around verse 23 or so, Jesus comes and tells them I give you the Holy Spirit who sins you forgive or forgiven, who sins you retain or retain. So who sins you forgive or forgiven, who sins you don't forgive or not forgiven. And then Jesus also told the apostles, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven, what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So from that moment when Jesus gives the apostles that gift, it's strictly for those men, and then they continue to pass on that power to their successors. And so from the very beginning, it was happening. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. It's changed a little bit in, in, in the idea of public. It used to be public confession, and then it became more private over time. So some of the ways of doing it were different, but it was public at a time, too. And your penance would be public, and it'd be, you may have months or years when you're sitting in sackcloth and ashes outside the church or something like that. So it was some, at some points they had really intense penances for bad things. I mean, it had to be pretty pretty bad. I mean, adultery or things that really broke your communion with the church. So, But they've changed the way it's practiced to some degree, but that sacrament has always been here. Any other questions? No? Hopefully that explains some of it.